Welcome to the Delling Pod with me, James Delling Pod. And I know I always say I'm excited about this week's special guest, but I am so excited about this week's special guest. It is Jay Dyer. Now, some of you are going to be going, like who? And some of you are going, going, wow, you've got Jay Dyer on the show. That is totally amazing. So I'm really looking forward, Jay, to going down the rabbit hole with you. But before I do that, but, but before we do the introductions, I want to cut to the chase and ask you a question, which is how totally screwed are we? And is there any hope of salvation in this life or is it, is it basically over for Western civilization? I would say that maybe our best hope would be some kind of um, collapse, as odd as that might sound, because uh, I, I got asked, Alex asked me that same question yesterday. He said, what, what's our hope here? What's our answer? I, I think that the system that they want to bring in is so fundamentally anti-human and, and in a way irrational. I know that sounds odd given the fact that it's kind of a technocracy, but uh, I think it's fundamentally anti-human and irrational. And so I think that that might be the weak point in what they're trying to bring in. So as odd and, and contradictory as it sounds, I would say, yeah, there is there is hope. Yeah. So by, by they, because I'm, I'm very conscious in, in the last in the last 12 months. I have, for want of a better phrase, gone down the rabbit hole in a way that pretty much every one of my, I used to, I used to be in the mainstream media. I used to be, um, you know, respectable. And all my contemporaries in journalism have, in, in UK journalism, have stayed respectable. Is it respectable? They, they've been too frightened or too uncurious, maybe, or too, too keen to stay within the confines of the Overton window to career safe, all these, for whatever reason, they don't want to go where I do. And I'm, I'm conscious that maybe a third of my audience is still wanting to remain in the real, in, 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 in the false world, in the, in the blue pilled world, let's say. So when we're talking about they, who are we talking about? We're talking about the people behind the great reset um, we're talking about the Trilateral Commission. We're talking about who else? Who are these these shadowy forces who are remaking our world against our, our interests? I would say that it would be that the, the uh, top um, banking elite families, the Fortune 100. Uh, and, and by the way, when I say this, I don't mean every single person in the companies. I don't mean every person in those families. Um, really, the people who run the steering committees, uh, the international uh, elites that meet every year at different groups, such as Bohemian Grove, Bilderberg, um, Davos is one of those many meetings. Um, they all, for the most part, will overlap. There's actually a great chart that uh, somebody made where it shows all the people who attend the Trilateral Commission. And this is just for media. They're also the heads of like, you know, the top mainstream media magazines. Uh, networks, right? And they also attend Bilderberg. So there's there's an overlap of huge, you know, power elites just in one field that are all kind of working towards one goal. Um, and there's a lot of this and it's been going on for a long time. So I think the easiest answer to that is just to talk about like what, what are called the steering committees, the NGOs, the think tanks, the and they kind of work underneath what you could say is kind of the the what Rothkop called the um, the managerial class. So there's about 6,000 of those people, uh, and they pretty much set the stage for how things will be implemented in what you could call the Atlantis Western power block. And um, are these kind of hereditary positions, or are these, is it, is it just a certain kind of person is attracted towards this to worm their way into the positions of power where they can rule the world? How does it work? Uh, there's a little bit of both. I mean, there is an element, uh, some people talk about the bloods and the brains. And so not everybody who is part of the power structure uh, has some sort of, you know, bloodline lineage or something like that. Um, in fact, that's probably less important than it used to be. Um, I think 
when we're talking about the rise of the British Empire, obviously the, that would be a lot of uh, obviously nobility, right? Um, but when, with the waning of the British Empire and the rise of the Pax Americana, it definitely shifted, which is what Quigley covers in Tragedy and Hope and then his other books as well, like Anglo-American Establishment. It definitely shifts over to um, the power base in America, which is, which is industrial, technocratic, um, and as I said, brain trusts. So there's a little bit of both. There are still old families that have a lot of power, a lot of wealth. I think the queen uh, has a lot of power, a lot of wealth, more so than, than a lot of people think. I don't think she runs the world, but um, she definitely has a lot of power. So so there's a little bit of both is some last request to answer that question. Hmm. I, I mean, I the first um, long, long discussion I saw of yours, which completely blew my mind and opened my mind um was your discussion of this book by carol quigley tragedy and hope which is a kind of it's it's one of the key to keys to all mythologies isn't it of, of 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 those people who understand how the world really works as opposed to the false narrative that most of us have been right. taught at school and stuff that book explains a lot and I think I also think you did me a favor I think you've saved me the bother of having to actually read the book I'm not sure it's necessary yes. to read the book I think your <laughs> your exegesis was 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 quite enough and just going going back you 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 think it all goes back to the uh 1776 is that when it all went wrong or is it is it even earlier than that I mean, what, oh, no, well, let me ask you first. Was there a golden age yeah. of, 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 of civilization where you think we had it right? Well, I do tend to be more of a traditionalist when it comes to like how I view church state relationships, that kind of stuff. So I do favor um, a, a stronger relationship between the two than probably most people would nowadays, especially given modernity and liberalism and all that. Um, you can definitely find a lot of. Uh, precedent for where we are today in uh, French Revolution and American Revolution. Uh, that was something I studied actually pretty intensely when I was in university. And uh, the weird part was that what the way I got into Tragedy and Hope, I, I'd heard uh, people in the sort of patriot sphere in America would, re would reference this book, and they always talked about it being an insider book. And it wasn't until I was in grad school that I actually got a found a copy in the university library, and I, I had it with me, and I was going through it, I was actually underlining it, which, you know, you're not supposed to do because it's, you know, it's not. <laughs> yeah, it's just. I, I had the book with me. I had the book with me in one of my uh, grad class. I had this really nasty uh, uh, UN affiliated professor who was just completely super liberal. And uh, he would always try to prod me and, and provoke me about this because he, he knew that I was, you know, studying this kind of stuff. And he'd say, he would say stuff like, you know, there's no world government. This is so ridiculous. This is, you know, they're not trying to do this. It doesn't exist. And, and one day he called me out in class, right? And so out in front of everybody, he calls me out and he says, he says, uh, uh, I'd like to, you know, give you the opportunity. Right? He gave me the force that why don't you prove to me your big grand conspiracy? And I just happened to have Tragedy Hope with me in class that day. Yeah. So I pulled it out and I said, well, I've got this here. And he's like, he didn't expect me to have it, right? He thought I was just going to say, oh, I watched a YouTube video and talked about conspiracies, right? So I had tragedy help. And I, so I pulled it out and I started going to the pages where he talks about the international steering committees. And I saw I was getting, he was getting madder and madder and madder. And finally he just said, you can get out of here. So he kicked me out of class that day. So I actually got kicked out of class in one of my grad classes for having tragedy hope in class. Um, Anyway, that's just a, a funny story, but uh, I, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm just kind of a bit of an autistic type of person, maybe, where where I've always grown up with this, you got to prove your case type of thing, right? Like if you don't have the evidence, if you can't prove it, you're going to get laughed at. So uh, I've always just thought, well, I got to go read all this stuff, right? I got to prove it. So I went, I read Tragedy Help a few years ago in grad school, uh, and, and you're right, it is extremely boring. It is extremely... Uh, Quigley was a uh, military historian, so he's he's not a uh, historian proper. And if you ever try to read military historians, it's pretty dry. It's pretty it's pretty dense. Um, but what he does, the reason he's important is that he was, for example, Bill Clinton's mentor. So he's the professor at Georgetown who's kind of mentoring future leaders, future government types, right? And it's it rumored at least i haven't been able to verify this but but supposedly the book was written as a kind of a white paper policy 
approach for CIA officials. Mm -hmm. So it's written for kind of that higher level international relations graduate type CIA type person who's going to be running operations because people were wondering why as Americans in the Cold War, because it's written during the Cold War, why, why are we funding liberal causes? Why are we funding? Why is there establishment U.S. funding for socialist causes, leftist causes, just things that don't seem to make sense with, you know, what we're supposedly fighting with, you know, communism and Sovietism. And so the book is an, an attempt to give an apologetic defense of that. It's a giant tome tragedy, the tragedy being the two world wars and then presumably the Cold War being the third war, the hope being Western democratic capitalism slash liberalism, AKA technocracy, which he, he says in the middle chapter. So that's the hope for the world. Um, and so that's what this book is, is it's basically an apologetic, it's, an, it's a defense of what we're doing. It's a defense of the establishment. Um, and he's very candid. Uh, it's, it's not that he's, everybody thinks when I talk about this book that I'm either promoting it or I'm saying that it's a conspiracy text. It's neither of those. It's just a, a policy paper. It's just, it's just a defense. It's just, what else is there, right? Now, Quigley's argument is that there's, there's really no other approach. Uh, we've yeah. lost in the West everything that we, that we could have had, right, in terms of the Middle Ages and that kind of stuff. That's all gone. So all we've got left is this need to bring in, via the banking elite, right, a global government. That's essentially what the book is saying. That is, that is scary because I grew up, I mean, I spent the first 50 years of my life imagining that I was a reasonably autonomous being, that um, governments were our servants rather than our masters, that they were motivated by desire to make things better for us all, that, that we were inevitably tending towards more liberty, um, that we'd sort of, I'd, I wasn't quite end of history, I'd, I'd, and, and I didn't believe the progressive narrative, but I nevertheless imagined that things were getting better not worse and that, uh, that 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 for example nazi germany um communist the, the soviet union whatever were aberrations rather than um milestones on the way to a uh, to a, a global totalitarian tyranny but i was living in the dream wasn't i we all we all have been uh I think all of us at some point live in that dream. Yeah. I mean, we're kind of born into that where we're born into that thinking that, you know, the leaders are there to give us the best possible life. They want to make everything. Like you said, they want to help everybody. And then, and then you, you realize over time, you hear more and more about, well, there's this scandal, that scandal, this scandal, that scandal. Uh, and, and then you realize that actually, you know, con artistry is a big part of how government, runs right i mean it, it's it's almost like the art of the con is a is a huge part of how media works of how government works psychological operations all of those things that play into um the bringing in of this type of government but just just to give maybe a quick rundown of the book what he says at the beginning is that the first few uh chapters he deals with where we are in terms of the post enlightenment post um scientific revolution world and he says that we are under what's what some other philosophers like Spengler have called uh, homo economicus, economic man. Man is now under the dominance of money uh, to the extent that uh, fractional reserve banking, uh, uh, lending right out in terms of interest, that is what dominates man. And he's not critiquing, he's just stating the facts, right? He's saying that that's how we we operate, he says, we've lived under a kind of post-Renaissance international order that assumes rights, that assumes kind of basic human humanitarian principles. And, and by the time he gets to the middle chapter where he's discussing the, the technocratic managerial government that's gonna come in for the whole world, mm -hmm. he says that that's all going away. Okay, that's gone. And the 20th century marks the end of that because what it was really about was the removal of the Atlanticist power blocks two main rivals, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, Germany, and, and then Russia, right? So those were the two potential rivals to the Western power block. And now that they have been removed, it's the victory of uh, what you could call liberal democracy, I suppose. Mm. Uh, although it's not really that because 
if you've read, you know, other writings that sort of complement this, the, 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 the phrase liberal democracy is more of a selling point. It's more of a propaganda line because it's not liberal. Um, it's very strictly rigid, ordered and tiered technocracy, AKA what's in Brave New World with the alphas, the omegas, right? Uh, and it's and it's not democracy. It's it's very much um, well ultimately run by AI. Uh, they, I mean, it Quigley even said in the middle middle chapter that uh, uh, AI will will actually run and govern and determine based on ration, rationing and quantities everything in life. So they had already kind of projected back then the carbon rationing, the carbon uh, limitations, all that kind of stuff would would be implemented. He clearly doesn't give any dates, but later writers kind of project in the terms of the actuaries of the 10, 20, 30, 50 year plans, they kind of give dates. But long story short, uh, yeah, the middle chapter is the one that's kind of overlooked because it, it details the technocracy and the fact that all of society will be run by AI and computers. And then the most famous chapter that people refer to in, in Tragic and Hope is the one where he talks about the elite putting all this money into of, of that time, particularly in the UK and in, in the US, putting so much money into liberal left and socialist causes. And, and so the book, he says, ironically, the Birchers, and I, I'm not a John Birch type of person, but he says that back at that time, the John Birch people had stumbled on basically what was going on, but they didn't know how to fit it into the narrative because they thought that it was Moscow <laughs> that was funding yeah. all the left and the social causes. And it wasn't. He says, no, no, it was, it was the Rockefellers. It was, it was the elite families in the West that were putting so much money into these uh, magazines and into the institutes, into the universities. In fact, this even was known uh, in terms of the Reese Committee. So we actually had hearings in the U.S. known as the Reese Committee hearings where they investigated the uh, funding of liberal socialist causes via, via the, the most wealthy families and, and uh, foundations in the U.S. Um, it's like obvious. <laughs> I mean, it's not even disputed, right? But what, one thing that happens in the U.S. that probably happens in the U.K. too, I think with some of the inquiries that you guys have, is that People do these inquiries and these investigations. They discover a whole bunch of skullduggery and scammery and evil, and then it just gets forgotten. Yeah. Yes. So why, you're absolutely right. I mean, almost everything that's wrong in the world, if you can follow the paper trail, then it goes back to the Rockefeller Foundation, say, or, or these various foundations, which I know are partly tax dodging devices aren't they but right. the amount of money that gets poured into liberal causes i mean george soros i suppose is the most obvious name in in this um what's the what's what's the end goal why why how does it work why do they do this what what's the benefit to their master plan of of having it, all these activities taking place well, one thing I would add is that it's not all, I mean, I know you know this, but just for the sake of the audience, um, the, the power elite don't always just fund liberal causes. A lot of times that seemed to be the most advantageous because they want to, to, to change society. So they have, for example, change agents. And so this is a long-term decades long plan of, for example, propping up and funding people in the sixties counterculture revolution, right? So a lot of the people who, who came out as these sort of troubadours of tune in, turn on, drop out, yeah. you know, like Leary. Leary was a change agent. And that's why he got this sort of Harvard and, and elite funding for what he was doing and dosing everybody with LSD was because the work, it was like an evangelist, right? So the change agents kind of function as these evangelists. I think people have even talked about Obama being a kind of a change agent, right? Which was whatever time point these people exist in, it's their, their job is to push the narrative, to push the Overton window to the next phase of the revolution. And, and Leary was very successful that there were many other people uh, around his time, uh, Owsley Stanley, who was the, the guy going around with uh, Grateful Dead, who was handing out 4 million tabs of LSD with the dead. Um, that was all done with the establishment propping up and funding. That was all intentional. Uh, they were change agents. In fact, uh, I think uh, Fritov Capra, another one of the big global elites, you may have heard of him given the, the work that you do deconstructing the green agenda and the green narrative. Uh, Capra is one of these big uh, uh, global pushers who wrote a book called Turning Point. And in Turning Point, he said, back, I think it was 1981 or two, he says the change agents are going to be crucial for, for transforming 
not just man's view of the world, but man's view of man. So understanding that man is a cancer on the planet, not a yeah. uh, being made in the image of God who has rights and this, this kind of stuff, right? But rather seeing man or our fellow human beings as even essential and non-essential. I dug up but via one of my buddies who sent me this old uh, uh, policy paper book from the 80s, early 80s, a book, uh, it's called Millennium, and it has a, a, a selection of authors. Uh, it's got Leary's in there, Marilyn Ferguson's in there who wrote Aquarian Conspiracy. Uh, it's got uh, a couple other of these big luminaries, uh, uh, Wallace Harmon, who wrote Changing Images of Man. Uh, Harmon wrote an essay in this book about how when the technocracy begins to come into play, he doesn't give a date, but he's thinking that down the, in the future. He says there will be a classification of essential and non-essential workers. <laughs> so they had already they had already had this sort of division planned out back uh, in the 70s and 80s. Um, and I know that that's maybe even older in the, in fiction with like a uh, great new world. But but yeah, so so uh, I went off on a tangent there. But uh, but yeah, that's that's what we're looking at here is a situation where they they. I forgot where were we at. Well, <laughs> I just we, went, we were, just were talking about you were talking about change agents, and, and I was really asking the question. Oh yeah, change agents. Yeah. Why? Why do things like the Rockefeller Foundation and George Soros? Why do they? Why do they That's fund right. the liberal money? causes? That's yeah. right. I think because liberalism itself is fundamentally the most useful for destruction in a way. Yeah. So it's kind of like I view it like a wrecking ball, right? So you, if you promote a bunch of liberalism, the wrecking ball kind of comes through and it clears out everything that was before. And that kind of allows you to to rebuild it and re-image it in the way that you see fit. Uh, Harmon, I mentioned, he has the one of the most famous white papers called or policy papers called "Changing Images of Man," and that whole document is about worldviews. It's about philosophy, worldviews, and how to alter everybody's view of nature and each other. And by doing so, this would be the means by which you could get people into that technocratic government, uh, that technocratic order. And he, and he says that it, is, it will require the change agents and, and liberalism is the most useful for this. Uh, the only time that there seems to be the funding of the right is when there's the need to have some sort of, you know, right wing quote extremist, right? Who oh. <laughs> like, a, like a McVeigh, right? So in, that, in those kinds of situations, then you can, uh, in my view, uh, then you can, you can fund the right wing or something like that. Uh, Soros, for example, in the Ukraine, um, put uh, uh, with the State Department, put money into probably sector right sector, which is the the, uh, the neo Nazi movements in Ukraine. So there is there are times in which the these the same power structure will put money into the far right, but that's just because they're tools and patsies. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting you, you mentioned the green movement because I suppose this was this was my first inkling that things were not quite right. So I wrote this book, but 10 years ago now called Watermelons, um, about, um, maybe longer ago, actually, uh, about climate gate and all that. And I sort of set out to examine if, if everything, if, if global warming isn't a problem, if, if, if climate change is, you know, the climate changes all the time and we're not really making much difference and there's nothing to worry about, then how has this thing become the dominant, the, one of the dominant um, genres in, in, in kind of the yeah. in political discourse? Why is it, why has it become, why is everyone talking about it? And I, I got sort of three quarters of the way there, but I, I, I hadn't realized the, the, the bottom line, which is that the whole of the environmental agenda is the purest bollocks it is just absolutely made up it is junk science it is lies and every time every time you you it's like whack-a-mole every time you, you you respond to another piece of false information they just come up with another one and there are so many of them and there are so few of us that that and i hadn't realized that 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 the climate agenda the green agenda is a a key part of the um the the technocracy narrative that they want to they want to make us as you say hate humanity the earth has a cancer the cancer is man you know the the voluntary human extinction movement you know they 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 there will always be a few crazes 
useful idiots who, who 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 push the narrative further and they then pour money into these causes and i mean the green movement is so well funded i get i get emails every day from different different green outfits which are obviously very well funded very well resourced um just pushing more bollocks um yeah it's no, so, I, th I think the green movement as I'm sure you know, has roots in Malthusianism, right? Mm. I mean, the Malthusian idea that uh, these these fake crises. I, I remember when I was when I was doing grad work, I had a a few days off just sort of, sort of working in the library, and I and I, I gave myself a, a, a task. I was going to look up everything I could find with Paul Ehrlich, right? Who's one of these right. early um, crusaders for this stuff. So. I went and I, I found in the research databases all these old things that he had written in the late 70s and early 80s, these papers. And and he was talking about the coming ice age. <laughs> How we know that by the 80s and 90s, we're going to be, there's going to be woolly mammoths rocking around and we're going to be like, you know, huddled up like Jeremiah Johnson or whatever in, in some cave. And all, it's all this nonsense, right? It was all pure baloney. Yeah. And then you could see, because uh, I was a child of the 80s, I remember in the 80s when the narrative shifted to, uh the ozone layer that was all they talked yes. about was all the ozone layer it's got a hole and we're all going to get cooked we're going to microwave and we're going to you know pop like a, a egg in the microwave or something like that. and that's all nonsense right and then the narrative shifted to global warming right in the two 90s 2000s and then it shifts into so you could tell that they were just like pr rebranding it just yes giving totally. it a new rebranding each yeah and so that started sticking out to me and i remember what you you on Alex, back in when your book came out, I remember hearing those interviews where you were talking about this. I listened to a lot of the interviews with and, and documentary work that uh, Lord Moncton had done. And it was obvious to me that, that was right around the time I was reading a lot of these global elite books. And I noticed that this is exactly what their plan does is it, it creates the idea that man is the problem. If you read that document, uh, First Global Revolution, yep. that the Club of Rome put out, it's, yep. it says we have decided that the the problem will be man man is the pollutant yeah. carbon is the problem right and yeah. what is carbon carbon is is life right so that once you understand the anti-human anti-natalist movement now you mentioned extinction rebellion that has all the same top funding all the same people funding the vegan movement by the way which is also a big part of this agenda now um, i found some of the global elite writers back in the 70s were saying stanford research documents were saying that we'll promote uh, veganism We'll tie it to uh, anarchism. We'll tie it to punk movements because that was at the time when punk was new. They were saying, "Oh, look, let's let's co-opt this punk movement, get them into anarchism and veganism." Yeah. And he said that that that'll be a big uh, factor for control in the future because, like Plato, Plato even said this back in the Republic. Plato said, "Don't feed the proles meat; give them grains. Right? We get them get them carb bloated, and 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 because meat, you know the." belief was and i think it's true makes you virile it, give, it gives you a lot of the nutrients that you actually need so um yeah i think that diet is huge when you go and you read these guys that like bertrand russell and a lot of the, the malthusians the eugenicists when you read um galton darwin when you read um hg wells you know they all just wrote all of this into their books and so i just kind of went down this project like you said a, a rabbit hole dive of reading all of these people i've gone through about 50 of the books and they all say the same thing. They all start their books. I'm saying all, generally speaking. They'll start it with crisis. We are in a crisis. The world is in a crisis. We've got so many people. How are we going to solve this crisis? And they'll even blame like people for things that they've done. Right? Like they'll brag that man, the elite have created, for example, nuclear weapons. Right? This is what uh, Russell does. This uh, Bertrand Russell says. We have created uh, uh, atomic weapons. We are, we are the height of uh, human evolution. And then he turns around a few chapters later and he's like, but because man has created these da disastrous atomic weapons, we must kill off most of the people because we can't get them, <laughs> we can't let them have. So he's, it's like a back and forth blame game, right? Um, and you'll notice that a lot. Anyway, long story short, is that they'll do this sort of um, uh, crisis scenario. Oh, we're all in crisis. Then We've got to have this plan put in, right? And it's just, it's the same. Every one of the books, it's like I was talking to Alex yesterday. He's like, I, he said, I read all these books, uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago. And then I realized they all just say the same thing. Yeah, it's, it's just a it's just a repeat. Uh, they'll just restate what the other guy says. And, and that's another way that you know it's a coordinated plan is that you wouldn't have all of these 
you know, high level uh, policymakers, uh, elites, wealthy people, social engineers saying the same things over at least a century if there wasn't a coordinated plan. Yeah, yeah. Once, once you've taken the red pill or whatever, it becomes so obvious, doesn't it? I mean, for, for example, I look at, uh, if you come across the concept of um, ocean acidification, ocean acidification, it's just complete bollocks. There is no evidence for, you know, the oceans yeah. are not turning acidic. There is, there might be a sort of a slight change in their pH value, but it's not, it's not causing the fish to, to melt and the, and the corals to dissolve. It's, it, this is not happening. And yet there are respectable university departments dedicated to promulgating this absolute lie. And I saw through it straight away because, you know, you get used to it after a while that ocean acidification was basically the Siegfried line. You know, if the, if the, if the forward defences failed, which was um, CO2 being a driver of, of catastrophic climate change, if somehow that narrative were to get derailed, then they had a secondary problem also illustrating that CO2 is, is bad and okay, you know. And I'm glad, I'm so glad you mentioned, you mentioned veganism because I've become very conscious of that, 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 that you think about, you know, but before I, before I became awake, as it were, I, I, 10 years ago, I probably would have believed the stories that you read in the mainstream media ad nauseam right. about how meat gives you cancer. Yeah, you know, okay, yeah. you can eat a little bit of meat, but not too much because it's like having plutonium on your plate. You know, you should really be eating vegetables. And you, 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 it's so ubiquitous, this narrative, that it's very hard not, well, they wouldn't say this shit unless it was true, you, you think. But when you understand that veganism is a, yeah. You, did you see that fascinating documentary, the propaganda documentary um, about the guy it starts with the guy in the gym doing skipping with his skipping rope and he and he used that to be a car game changers game changers tell me that's 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 complete i mean gladiators oh, at at yeah. <laughs> vegetables tell, tell me how, do you know did you know anything about that well yeah no one of my good buddies uh he does a channel dedicated to uh paleo keto and uh carnivore based diets and uh, i got into his material actually because i was having my own like gut digestion issues from having a bad diet growing up i, I mean in america we have just the worst you do imaginable, you know diet that's it's terrible sort of foisted upon you from you you don't even know it right um and so i had to you know confront these problems myself and i, I got into this because i heard jordan peterson on with joe rogan talking about carnivore and then his daughter, Michaela, was talking about it. And I had some of the same problems that she had. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll, I'll look into this. I tried everything else. I was having, you know, no luck fixing the problems. And then I got into my buddy's channel. Um, and we got to be good buddies, Tristan, over at the Primal Edge Health. And uh, he did a whole deconstruction of that documentary. Like, he just went, you know, point by point by point from the documentary, de deconstructing all the propaganda. I was never really taken in by veganism. I, I knew it was a uh, suspect. I could, I just always loved steak growing up. So I was like, yeah, yeah. I can tell that that's good for me. I don't, I don't need like, you know, a documentary to tell me that I shouldn't eat something that, uh, you know, I know is good. Um, but then when I did go carnivore for a while, uh, for about a year, over a year, I'm still 90, 95% carnivore. I have a little bit of carbs, but Long story short, it did fix my gut issues. And so that's one personal, just subjective way that I know that that's all BS is that I was having problems when I was eating a largely grain or uh, even vegetable based diet. Yeah. And it would, I couldn't fix the problems. I, 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 I had, um, I had Lyme disease and, and I went to this clinic in Germany for some um, stem cell therapy you know you, you 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 try everything when you get Lyme disease because it's it really screws you up and and it's like having right. you know every week you've got a different manifestation you know, it's it's called um uh it, it, the great mimic it mimics other diseases anyway um when I was having this treatment I was encouraged to go on a, on a a vegan diet for three months and it was the most all you think about every day is is how you're going to be able to eat something because there are so going vegan you cut out so many basic stuffs 
like eggs right. you can't eat you can't eat cheese you can't have milk you can't have meat above all you can't have right. meat why would anyone do this it is lunatic absolutely lunatic i did not feel better at all you know people say it's anti-inflammatory i mean there's so much absolute rubbish talked about these it things is. um it's so total, i'm glad yeah. yeah yeah just tell me but we're we're, we're, we're sort of well into the podcast now and I haven't really introduced you because I just wanted to cut to the chase with asking that <laughs> question okay. first but Jay just tell me a bit about yourself tell me about your uh your background your 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 awakening and how it all how it all came about uh yeah I'm just a an American born um southern born actually guy who uh my dad was in the navy so I grew up in San Diego for many years uh he was at the base there had a weird uh, experiences out there in the, in the weird, that's like a test tube for weird educational models out there. So I was put into some weird classes when I was a kid out there. Um, and then good, good weird or bad weird, bad weird. Uh, they had these sort of, um, these programs that were geared towards, um, the, it, it was a United Nations connected program for gifted kids where they were, they basically trying to groom, future globalists to make to be to be frank um that's what that's what those programs are for uh i, I later researched this as an adult looking back on on those programs but anyway i mean nothing bad happened to me i wasn't like molested or anything like that it was just it was just a weird uh i, I could tell that they were already grooming people for stuff even you know um when i was a kid but uh, so, uh, no, I grew up in the, ended up back in the South, grew up in the South, went to just a local state university, uh, studied uh, English philosophy and history. And then uh, about 2002, three, I started questioning the events, the big nine event. Uh, if this is going on YouTube, I'll use my, my safe code words. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, started, que started questioning the big nine and then... Um, watched some documentaries at that time. I, I was really into theology and philosophy. Uh, I hadn't really gotten into the geopolitical espionage conspiracy world yet. I, I read a little bit, but uh, then I think about my, about 2004 or five, I, I just went in a deep dive of uh, studying about the history of skull and bones, studying about secret societies, all that kind of normal so-called conspiracy stuff that's kind of at that time, Templar stuff was everywhere and Da Vinci Code was everywhere. And I was never taken in with any of that stuff. But because it was everywhere, it just kind of, you, you know, you go in a, a Barnes and Noble, a bookstore, and you would see like a whole shelf of the Templars, the secret of the Templars and all this. So I did get deeper and deeper into um, studying that stuff. But I always wanted to do it from more of an academic perspective. So when I was doing my undergrad, I was focusing on film theory um, and philosophy and the, the interplay between the two and decided to try to write on uh, Ian Fleming. So I, I got deeper and deeper into British intelligence, uh, the history of Ian Fleming, what all he was up to in his uh, own personal life and operations and how he wrote that into the, the Bond stories. Uh, so focused on that in my, my graduate work um, and that led me into a lot deeper geopolitical stuff. Right. So at the same time, I was, you know, so I basically was just trying to integrate a lot of different fields and stuff I was looking at researching. Always loved literature, always loved, uh, uh, you know, Southern Gothic, Flannery O'Connor, Faulkner, that kind of stuff. Uh, and so it was just it was just a mix of fields. I wanted to I wanted to study what I was reading in British spy fiction and put that into what I was studying with the psychological warfare and how that works in terms of advertising. A lot of people don't know there's an overlap between a lot of the people who went into advertising when it was you know if you think about the the show mad men right that's, yeah. that's kind of rough roughly based on some of the guys who had been in uh, the oss and then they went into the ad world so i was reading and studying that kind of stuff and then you know put it into this thesis about uh, bond and how bond functioned as a cold war tool i think bond was was a tool of the cold war basically to, to help fight this so-called ideological battle but Anyway, so that just led me into Hollywood stuff. And the more that you read about Hollywood stuff, you start, oh, a lot of these people are doing other things. A lot of actors are actually uh, intelligence assets, <laughs> which blew me away when I first heard that. I was like, that's crazy. What? But yeah, it's actually, there's a, there's a long history of this. Uh, I'm not the only person who's, there, there's a lot of academics beyond me that have written uh, theses about this. Uh, Trisha Jenkins wrote a whole book on this from UT. Um, Operation Hollywood's another academic book that covers this. But anyway, so, so I was just noticing a lot of these parallels and sort of cross-disciplinary connections. Um, 
And then um, I started blogging about 11 years ago, uh, just for fun. Uh, I didn't have any intention of doing this. I just thought, well, I'll, I'll blog. And I wanted to be a professor. That's really all I cared about. Had that big falling out with that professor when I was writing my grad paper, uh, my thesis, and then uh, ended up quitting. I was like, I'm done. I'm not doing this. <laughs> so I just started doing my own media. I was like, why don't I just do that? That'd be fun to do. Uh, and I just kept up with the research, the different fields that I'm into. And, and so then here we are a few years later, it led to um, we did a, a couple books uh, based on my Hollywood analysis. Uh, we did a TV show on the basis of the first book. Uh, and then now, you know, doing all this. So so that's how we got to where we're. it's just a kind of a snowball that just turned into its own thing. In, in a way, you've you've carved out the career that you wanted, but in a, in a slightly different way, because I never would have expected it to go this way. Yeah. There would there would have been no, surely what you, you must be aware now. There is no place for people like you or me in academe because academe has fallen. I mean, could you? Oh, uh, yeah, that's why I left. Yeah. Uh, I realized. So, what I realized was that when this guy, so he was the head of the department, just a super, super liberal green. He's actually a huge guy in the green uh, movement. I realized that he wasn't going to approve the paper that I put a year into writing unless I went along with and agreed to the, the agenda. It's very cliquish, right? So, academia is very click driven. You don't get into the click unless you accept the dogma, which. Yeah. People think that aren't in academia, they think that, oh, you go to academia to show off how <laughs> brilliant your ideas are. And if, and if you win the argument, you will win everybody. No, 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 it doesn't work like that. <laughs> it's a top down click. It doesn't work the way people think. So um, that's how I got a lot of exposure firsthand to the way academia really works, how peer review publishing really works, how uh, my how, mom was an editor. So I, I had, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so uh, I'm sure you know, having researched all that stuff, that the peer review is kind of a joke. It's not, not everybody, but I'm saying that that it's not what people think that it is, right? I mean, there's there are loads of documents and papers published in peer review that are pure garbage, and this has been exposed, right? There have been people who've exposed all of this uh, peer review fraud now, scientific fraud. There's in fact whole websites dedicated to just documenting uh, science fraud. Mm. Uh, and my mom, as I said, she was a, a longtime editor for a copy editor for a uh, the biggest science publisher in the U.S., Harcourt Brace. And then uh, so I, 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 what I learned from that growing up with her doing that job was that it's not a matter of like you just put your paper out there and then all of the objective altruistic scientists come and read the paper and then, oh, well, we'll we're all going to bow down to the evidence. It doesn't work. Like Harcourt Brace is a billion dollar company. Right. And so they have a huge say. And what gets published and what doesn't get published and most people don't think about billion dollar corporations having a say in the science realm but they absolutely do yeah. right so uh and i'm not trying to allege that every scientist is in on some conspiracy i don't think it works that way i'm just saying that peer review doesn't work the way people think and hence why the lancet can say what a few years ago that upwards of 50 percent of peer review papers are, are full of garbage yeah yeah, yes, that editorial in The Lancet was written by a guy who was nevertheless, you know, balls deep in the whole scientism exactly. and junk science. It's extraordinary right. that there's, uh, yeah, you see, everything becomes much clearer, you know, conversations like this, the, my researches with other, with other people in the last year or so, um, things that previously puzzled me, for example, this is just this whole COVID-19, you know, pandemic, this fake scare. The thing that really struck me was how very early on in this so-called pandemic, shops all over the country were very, very eager for you not to use cash. And I was thinking, yeah. where the hell did that come from? And, and also, also, every, I don't know whether you had this in the US, but every petrol station had a pre-printed uh, sort of banner going around it saying stuff like we salute our nhs heroes we just yes. the, the the propaganda operation w w was almost ready to roll before before i mean before people even dropping dead it was it was bizarre and i kept asking people well do we know who's responsible for this banner campaign and 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 where are the where are the orders coming from for um, this? Don't use cash. And then 
I got involved that I have a friend who manufactures this very effective zinc, um, zinc sulfate drops, which are very, very powerful, much better than you can get over the counter. And this stuff had been proved to disrupt cytokine storms. So, so the very thing you want when you've got a viral respiratory infection like COVID-19, you know, this would, this would stop you dying. And I was reading around. I mean, I've, I, these guys in, in government now, they, these are my university contemporaries. I mean, I, I, I am a creature of the swamp, if you like. I mean, I am very establishment in my education. Um, I was at Oxford with two prime ministers. I, I've got friends in the cabinet and stuff. These are guys that my mates and I thought they were on the same page as me. We had the same values. Um, so I was, I was ringing them up or using contacts to get this stuff to them and wondering why they weren't going, yeah, this is fantastic. We can, we can now stop people dying. We can get the economy back running again. And it's only really 12 months later that I realized they don't want this to be cured. They don't want ivermectin. They don't want hydroxychloroquine to work because that was never the plan. The vaccine passports were always the plan. It, but so many people don't want to know this stuff. I mean, they want to call people like you and me tin foil hatters, don't they? I mean, how have you yeah. coped with this? I read a good uh, essay the other day by a guy talking about why that is. And, and obviously there's many reasons why, you know, people are, uh, have fear and whatnot, but this was making a good point that people kind of are trained to see the government, like you said at the beginning of the interview, uh, as the, the big daddy that's there to help you. Right. And so to undermine, they see it as an undermining of a kind of security blanket that they feel that, well, look, those people over there in Washington, those people over there, you know, in Parliament, they're there to, to make good decisions to help us. They want the best for everybody. Yeah. And to undermine that is to cause a kind of, uh, it, it shakes the paradigm of that person. And as, as somebody who's done many, many years of debate, uh, I've seen firsthand in hundreds of cases what happens when you shake somebody's paradigm. The reaction is anger. The reaction is, I can't have been wrong all these years. You are the problem, right? So it's just like allegory of the cave when we, when, when uh, Socrates goes around and starts questioning people's paradigms and he's shaking the, you know, pointing out that they have shaky foundations for their beliefs and they get mad at him. Right? And so he becomes uh, right, shoot the messenger type of situation. So I think that, that, that essay I'd read was a really good insight that the, that the real problem that people have isn't with the information or the, the so-called tenfold hat person or the conspiracy theorist it's their own um, insecurity in terms of how they have perceived daddy figures, authority figures, right? Because it's almost like they didn't mature in their thought process to a certain level to where they just sort of default over to that figure, right? In the, the big daddy government, big daddy state, big daddy corporation, they're gonna save me, right? The people at Microsoft, they have my best interest. Joe Biden has my best interest. Mm -hmm. they, they're gonna do what's best for everybody. And if you shake that confidence that I have, I mean, how could it be wrong? We have, uh, we have iPhones, we have refrigerators. How could this be wrong, right? That's the yeah. sort of, I think, the, the infantile kind of thinking that goes on. Mm. I don't know whether you can answer this, this question, because Jay, we, we could talk for about, I reckon, two or three weeks comfortably and, and never exhaust the, the possible um, avenues of conversation. It just, it's brilliant. There's so much to talk about. Um, I mean, I feel I feel born again, actually. I feel like, you know, even though it's terrifying, I feel like I've discovered the world in you. And, and I'll have to come lay hands on you and I'll talk and talk. I'm joking. <laughs> I think you should. Well, am I right in thinking you, you, you are Eastern Orthodox? I'm Orthodox. You? Yeah. You see, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not an evangelical TV preacher. I was just joking. Put your hands on the screen and pray with me. <laughs> but it's interesting. I, 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 I sometimes think that um events in our lives were there for a reason that 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 nothing is accidental that 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 that, that we're on a journey and and um i think that events in my life have led me to this to this point that that i've got a, i've got a key role to play and it's a, and it's a, it's a good role to play like the, i think you're playing a good role as well i mean it's just great talking to you um 
But I have this American, uh, one of my best buddies at Oxford was this American guy who was doing a postgrad. Um, he, he now teaches literature at um, one of the North Carolina universities. So as you can imagine, he's, he's much more of a liberal, a left liberal persuasion than I am. Otherwise he wouldn't, I suppose, have a, have a place in, in the academy. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but, but he was a great, he was a great, um, great traveler. And we, and we went on these amazing road trips and did all sorts of things. And one of the weird things he decided that we were going to do together, we were going to go to Mount Athos. Have you been to Mount Athos? Actually, I was planning to go this year. It's just, I'd, I'd like to go to Mount Athos again. Uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing. It is absolutely amazing. Um, and I remember going to this, you know what a skeet is? A skeet is like mm -hmm. a, is a mini monastery. So we went to this skeet. Right. I think it was... It might have been Ukrainian Orthodox. It was. It was. It wasn't Greek Orthodox. So it was one of the minority ones. Um, and uh, there was a guy, the holiest guy I've ever met, was called Father Seraphim, and he, you know, he knocked on this heavy medieval wooden door, and and this tiny sort of uh, the postern gate, I think they're called, opened up, and a, an acolyte came out, and 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 then. Father Seraphim appeared with these piercing blue eyes, and we were given this cup of well water with a bit of sherbet at the bottom. And it was—I really felt like I was in the in the presence of of of, of God. Um, and I just think Eastern Orthodoxy seems to have it in a way that I mean, the Catholic Church has been the Pope is is just—it's been infiltrated, hasn't it, by the enemy? Um, oh yeah. Uh, was in question. Yeah. When did that happen, by the way? I was listening to one of your talks to where you had the, the Anglican minister on where you guys were talking about that. And um, um, I have put a, a good bit of time into that. I think that it was earlier than Vatican II. I think Vatican II is kind of the flowering of a longer kind of problem. I mean, if, if for an Orthodox person, we would date the problem, <laughs> you know, about a thousand years ago, right? Uh, around 1054 or earlier, actually. But um the West and the East were kind of going in different directions uh, from about the time of the seventh, eighth and ninth centuries. But I would say that in terms of this more so um, subversion and infiltration, there, there was a long period of that going on since the founding of the Masonic lodges in Europe. So, uh, and, and you can see this by the papal encyclicals that were being written even in the 1700s about Freemasonry. And there's a series of those. There's about 10 or 15 encyclicals that, and, and uh, apostolic writings, so-called, by the Pope that had been addressing this problem. And all of the things that they had been addressing in their encyclicals, particularly uh, Humanum Janus by Leo XIII, describes the attempt to change the Christian religion into a just kind of almost a new age kind of cult, right? Where while well, we're all just brothers and let's all just get along. And, and so masonry, he says in that encyclical, is kind of the... Um, it's the competitor Catholic religion, okay? So what Roman Catholicism is in terms of the claim of being the universal church, he says in that encyclical, Freemasonry is a naturalistic attempt to be the real true skeletal over umbrella religion, basically. So he warns about it as, as a um, infiltrating counter force to the church. And there's other, there's a long history to this, but long story short, I'm not saying it's all Freemasons, but I'm saying there is a big, role to play for for that but there's an important book that you're going to want to read um written by a catholic lawyer who's a, a really solid guy um his name is uh, david wimhoff and he wrote a book about the uh usage of the catholic church on the part of the intelligence agencies it's called the cia's doctrinal warfare program and so what happened was that uh, around the time right before and after vatican ii Western intelligence establishment had decided that, including basically Rockefeller had, had tried to have these meetings with Paul VI and they wanted to try to get the Catholic Church on board with the uh, depopulation program. And initially the, the, the Pope at that time still was has, no, we're not gonna do that, we can't do that. So what they did was they sent in a lot of people who were change agents for the Roman Catholic Church. And one of those most famously, not, not the only one, but many of those was uh, the famous Jesuit, John Courtney Murray. And John Courtney Murray was working directly with C.D. Jackson, uh, Claire Booth Luce, um, and, and multiple uh, people in the intelligence establishment, part of the CIA, to change the Catholic Church. So basically, long story short, to make it an engine like an NGO. 
let's use the Catholic Church as an NGO for Americanism, for democracy, and for basically pop, in the long term population control. Right. Uh, as as wild as that sounds, uh, yes. And so um, it it's taken many many decades to get to Francis, <laughs> but Francis is really kind of the uh, the end result of a long term attempt to subvert and use the Roman Catholic institution. Um, and that's not unique to Rome. Uh, it's the same model of buying and, and funding seminaries that the Rockefellers really pioneered. This is how they were able to change. And there's a whole chapter in the Rockefellers authorized biography. I'm not making this up. Uh, they brag about the fact that they were able to subvert and change the Protestant denominations to make them into basically just liberal social gospel entities. Uh, to turn them into NGOs, basically. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, it, it's, it's about the middle chapter, I think, of the, of the authorized biography of the Rockefellers by Collier and Horowitz, where they discuss this. And they did that through the ecumenist movement. So they, they funded the ecumenism movement, water down World Council of Churches, National Council of Churches, waters down the Protestant world. Uh, and, it, and it just took a lot longer with Rome than it did with the Protestants. The Protestants were able to be... Uh, uh, taken over within a, a couple decades of the 1920s and 30s and 40s. And then Rome, it took a little bit longer. But by the time of Vatican II, I, I just I just see Vatican II as the expression of that that uh, um, acquiescence, basically, to this doctrinal warfare program. And then over time, it, it gets even wilder and wilder and wilder. And, and you're not going to see, uh, in terms of Rome, um, any pullback. Uh, you're not going to get a Cardinal Sarah. You're not going to get some conservative bulldog uh, trad Cardinal because that doesn't exist anymore. Yes. All the traditional, the last traditionalist pre-Vatican II Bishop just died <laughs> the other day. So uh, everybody who presently exists as a Cardinal to elect the next Pope uh, is not going to elect anybody traditional. So um, I, there, there's not much to hope for in terms of the Roman Catholic world. And that partly long story short is why, uh, I started looking at orthodoxy about about 10 years ago. Mm. It took me many years to convert. I didn't want to do it haphazardly. But uh, yeah, I, I spent a long time studying and researching orthodoxy before I finally made that move. But but yeah, that, so the real story of, of Rome is best discovered in David Wimhoff's book, uh, John Courtney Murray, CIA, uh, Time Life magazine, John Courtney Murray in the Doctrinal Warfare Program. Okay. Okay. That 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 sounds. Yeah. My my reading. I'm I'm, I'm wondering whether there's going to be time to read all these books because uh, before that's the, an excellent book before the apocalypse. Um, but <laughs> what one thing I do. I, I well, two things I, I want to read are, are are your your Hollywood books, which I which I haven't I haven't oh, got thanks. yet. But but um, because I'm fascinated that that the, the, there have been these these movies with, well, so, some movies which operate as kind of propaganda operations, but presumably are there also movies made by white hats, as you might, you might call them, showing us what's really going on, sort of slipping information under the radar? I yeah, mean, it's always hard to know everybody's motives. And, and of course, obviously, any movie has a lot of people working on it, has a lot of hands, you know, a lot of, a lot of minds going into that work. So, um, you know, you can't, you can't paint it with a completely broad brush, but uh, I, I think at times maybe some, and some actors or, or, or excuse me, um, artists might be conflicted figures. I think maybe Kubert was a conflicted figure who in his earlier days had, had definitely made some compromises with the system. Um, and then I think later on kind of regretted some of those compromises that he had made with the, with the system. And um, I don't have any specific conspiracy theory about him being killed. I mean, he could have been killed. I don't know. But uh, I do think that he he's kind of telling people in the films what's going on. Um, what, what, which, which films are you thinking of particularly? Not, well, not for Barry example, in, or... well, it, well, I mean, if you look at there's there's that thread of, of uh, the, the PEDO, you know, throughout Kubrick films. Right. Uh, if so, from Barry Lyndon to uh, The Shining to Lolita to Eyes Wide Shut, uh, and probably even a couple more I'm forgetting. I mean, he, he's he's consistently talking about this problem of elite pedophilia, right? Um, I think I think he was highlighting that. Uh, that's just my own opinion. That's interesting. May, may not have been. Yes, yeah. I mean, this is this is this, um, uh, this is one of my sort of new discoveries about you know since going down the rabbit hole. I mean, this tell me about the pedophilia thing. Why is it so huge? 
Is it because it's compromising? Is it because it's kind of, it feels so dirty and wrong that, 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 that elites are attracted to the dirty and wrong things or what? Yeah, I think it's a multi-layered thing as well. Uh, I think that some families um, are evil. I think that they believe in generational propagation of evil, as, as odd as that may sound. Mm. Um, I think that evil usually wants to replicate and create more evil. Um, you know, Jesus describes evil like leaven, and, and he says, you have to watch out because it'll spread. So I think that there's a the desire on the part, and I've, I've read enough of the accounts of people who've undergone this kind of stuff, a lot of books on trauma, a lot of books on SRA, uh, ritual abuse. I don't mean from conspiracy theories, I mean from MDs, from psychiatrists and psychologists. Uh, Dr. Colin Ross has a lot of good books on this. Uh, and it seems to be that some of these people are, are they're legitimately committed to, to evil to, as a worldview, as, as a system. They think that it is an empowering thing. Um, a lot of wealthy families uh, are committed to this. And so I think that there's that level, which is it's seen as a uh, one of the most, quote, empowering acts is the destruction of innocence. So to, if you can destroy and remove innocence, uh, that power that's believed to give a lot more power. Yeah. Um, I've been recently researching a lot of the, the serial killers uh, just as a side project as well as organized crime. And I'm noticing a lot of overlap between the attitudes or right? the attitudes of the psychopathic sort of narcissistic attitudes that serial killers have. That's very similar to the attitude that a lot of high powered elites have um, wealthy billionaires have as well as, uh, you know, organized crime figures, right. Uh, hitmen, assassins, that kind of stuff. And so the, the tendency seems to be, you know, kind of obvious abuse when they were young. And, and in many cases, I think that abuse was intentional. They, there's an intentional uh, knowledge of that you can propagate evil via abusing people, right? Mm -hmm. Because if someone's abused, they're probably going to be an abuser when they grow up. And I don't think that's a, you know, recent discovery. I think people have known that for a long time. So that's one level. And then I think there's, as you said, the other elements of um, compromise. There's other uh, situations that are just like Epstein situation. There's the North Fox Island case that has just come to light um, in the 70s in Michigan, which was an Epstein operation being run out of Michigan by uh, very wealthy people. Um, there's the uh, all the connections to Savile, the Savile case, uh, which I've gotten pretty deep into. That's obviously a lot of compromise and contract killing, it would seem. So so I think that's what's really going on here is a, is a multi-layered thing. And ultimately, it's evil, right? I mean, it it suggests that there is a real power and force of evil. In my, in my view, I, I think Satan's real. I I think you're right. I think you're right. And, the, and, and that, that saying, you know, the, the devil's best trick was convincing us that he didn't exist, I think is, 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 is very true. I think, I think going, going back to the, the themes about liberal democracy being a chimera and so many of the things we're taught, I, I think so much of our education has been designed to steer us away towards the notion, uh, away from the notion of evil. That, for example, yep. serial yes. killers, as you said, are, are a product of of damaged. You know, they're not really responsible for their own actions, but what they do is not evil. That only deeds are evil. Right. People can't be evil, and I'm not sure that that's true. I think that people, some people, seek out evil, and I think. I mean, we could go, yeah. we could go really down the rabbit hole. You know, we could talk about the transmigration of souls. I mean, you must have heard this theory that the 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 power elite uh, have this this they have that view yeah. reincarnate themselves. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that that is, I mean, do you do you think what's being played out now is is really the perennial battle between good and evil, and that we are approaching some kind of uh, apocalypse um well i think we're definitely in the battle perennial battle of good and evil but um as to whether it is for sure the last days I, I don't make any predictions about that it could be i don't know um i mean i take the orthodox view that um as many of the orthodox saints and elders say that when we do approach that end we will know the church will will know so we don't have to we don't have to necessarily worry, worry about that but there's definitely some things occurring that look like i mean the QR codes that everybody's going to, you know, they're going to try to have everybody have this, the idea of a total internet of things where everything's going to be tracked and traced. I mean, that does seem pretty apocalyptic. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised, but again, I'm going to refrain from, you know, kind of 
jumping and, and being rash in my uh, and assessments, but but it's definitely the playing out of good and evil. Um, I, I don't believe that there is the real transmigration of souls. I think that that's that's a view that many of the elite do have. They do think that they can you know that they can do that. This is part of the reason for their rituals. It even ties into um, the attitudes towards transhumanism. Um, they think that they'll be able to achieve that ultimately via technology. Um, as an Orthodox Christian, I don't believe that. I believe that God creates the soul, and uh, then after the, the after death, there's the judgment. But so I don't believe in in uh, in that. But I do believe in, in the reality of possession. And uh, one thing I've noticed after after this deep dive into the serial killers is that there's a recurring pattern that's been completely lost in the the so-called profile uh, of serial killers, which is <laughs> that many of them are explicitly involved in satanic cults. Um, they're directly involved in some other form of occultism. Um, and they, they, most of them have either had military assassin training or they've been traumatized or, or are MPD DID. And that has, that's, you don't ever hear this, uh, this, this, you know, the, the mainline narrative um, is the opposite of all that. Nobody ever, ever talks about that. Uh, and, and the reason I bring that up is that is not to be morbid or to have some weird fixation on serial killers, but just that it, it points to the direct evidence of evil, a spiritual evil. I mean, yeah. when I was reading about Cyril Smith and Ed Heath. I mean, those guys are evil, like legitimately, seriously evil. <laughs> There's still so little that's come out about Ted Heath. I mean, Cyril Smith, unquestionably, right. the, 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 we've got the evidence. We've got eyewitness accounts of his disgusting behavior. Yeah. Are, are we, are we, have you got stuff on Ted Heath that you, you find that? Uh, probably not anything beyond what you just what was out in kind of the uh mainstream british press but um i mean i i've i've gotten pretty deep into some other uh, killers that are lesser known uh, that are uh, probably some of the most evil stuff i've ever seen I, I'll, I'll hesitate to say what it is and, and who it is and all that but <laughs> uh, there is some evidence that i have uncovered on some of these guys yeah right um now this is a person, by the way, who's not known. Uh, he's he was a, a contract killer who is in jail for the rape of a minor. Um, he's almost dead, uh, but but he confesses to in interviews that have just recently come to light <clears throat> that he did in the '90s to uh, for uh, foreign publications. Uh, he confesses to many things that line up with the actual uh, series of events. So I think 99% <laughs> sure that. He's the one that did these horrendous murders. The, uh, and it was never, never sort of dealt with in the media. It was never really. No. Interesting. Interesting. One reason that could be is that in the case of some of these people, I, <clears throat> I think that they actually work for uh, the government. Um, now, I, I don't know what your view of Myra Hindley and Ian Bradley and all that is, but my suspicion is that they perhaps could have been contract killers. I, I can't understand why. Who was it? Um, Lord Longford, Lord Astor uh, are lobbying for Myra Henley to be freed for years and years and years. Well, of course, b before I went down the rabbit hole, my, my explanation would have been, well, Lord Longford was a kind of wishy-washy liberal, yeah. liberal duke. <laughs> but, but now you d I just don't know anymore. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Well, do, do you know, do you know a couple of serial killers in uh, the U S uh, Henry Lee Lucas was commuted by Bush uh, the most famous of what, according to the, num the numbers, uh, Henry Lee Lucas, I think, has the top numbers in the U.S. Uh, why would George, why would W uh, pardon him, him, commute him? And I think in Florida, his his co cohort uh, Otis Tool also sees, received a commutation from I think Jeb. Uh, well, I could say one reason that you might get that kind of a commutation is that it, that you work for the government. You work for somebody. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, you see, again, like when I was first, do when I was doing these interviews with Alec Jones uh, um, about the Green Movement, and he was talking about false flags and stuff, and he was talking about it in a kind of matter of fact way. And I was thinking, well, you know, here I am dealing with the crazies. I'm just giving a bit of truth, you know, about the Green Movement to, to this crazy guy who does this crazy show that for, for tinfoil hat people. And of course, now I realize that no, I mean, the this is it is quite shocking i think it, going back to that point we we made about people don't like having their father figure suddenly taken away from them being told that that dad 
the government, big government, their friend is actually Jimmy Savile <laughs> or, or some, you know, he's hasn't got their best interests at, at, at heart. Yeah. Um, well, but, but the weird thing that I just noticed on that point recently with people is that, so I, I delved into two different subjects that everybody likes that doesn't relate directly to the new world order, uh, the mafia organized crime yeah. and the serial killers. Right. So here's two different things that oh, everybody loves true crime. Everybody loves mafia movies and mafia stories. Now, everybody believes that this goes on at the local level, right? Everybody knows there's local gangs. Everybody knows there's killers. We, we have uh, around here in Tennessee, at least two or three famous killers, right? That, that were, we have the vampire killer uh, who was from Kentucky. Uh, we have uh, the, the Memphis, uh, West Memphis killings of the, the kid that was supposed to be Damian Eccles and all that fiasco. And yet people don't think that you could extend that to the highest levels of power, right? So you believe that this stuff goes on locally. Yeah. You believe in local corruption in government, good old boys, right? In the South, we have this notion of the local corrupt kind of boss hog figure being called, right? The boss hog, the, yeah. the good old boys, right? But that doesn't go on at that higher level yeah. and it doesn't go on at an international level. Of course it does. Mm. Yes. I, sh I wanted to ask you about the, the, the movie thing. Do you, are you, are you, do you watch Netflix at all? Are you a fan of... Um... Um, uh, I, I've watched a, quite a few things on Netflix. I don't. I personally can't stand Netflix, but uh, I've seen a lot of productions of Netflix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, this isn't a Netflix production. I don't know what, what it comes under. In, in the in the what my favorite, my all time favorite TV series, you know, better than The Sopranos, better than Breaking Bad, is a series called Gomorrah. Have you ever seen it? Gomorrah is about the, I'm, I'm the Gomorrah. That, no. It's set in in Naples. And it's, okay. it's, it's incredibly bleak. I mean, it's about, you know, it's about the mob and it makes it clear that life is nasty, brutish and, and, and short. And even, even the heads of the, of, of the Kimura clans live, well, it was written by a, the, the guy who now lives in America, um, Roberto Savoyano. He, he's a he's a lecturer at a, a, a you know he studied he grew up in Naples he lived he you know he was at school with these people, but it's very mm. it's very the vision of the world is very nihilistic. These people have squalid lives. Um, you know, all they can get for their money is kind of heavily armored vehicles. They but they they live in crappy uh, housing projects just just in with with with, with glitzier furniture and stuff um, and and. But this is this is part of a, a development in our kind of culture, isn't it? Whereby we've become um, inured to extreme violence, and whereby yeah. whereby we're encouraged. Actually, probably a better example. We're encouraged to. Have you seen Narcos? About I did um, watch the first, almost first season. I think yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Narcos, where do your sympathies lie? I mean, certainly not with the DEA. You know, you want to you, you you're with the uh, with 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 the, the the drug king kingpins, aren't you? You know, you want to be Pablo Escobar with your fantastic zoo in um, yeah. in, in, in the, dog, <laughs> right. you know, the flamingos and the hippos and stuff. And I was just wondering, does the does this accord with this is this is part of the plan, presumably this this kind of desensitization towards violence, this glamorization of 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 the bad guys at the expense of the notional good guys the cops that is that a is that a thing i think there there is some of that yes uh and that does fit into the psychological warfare i mean i remember when i was reading about so the, the way i originally got into that topic was noticing the trends in spy fiction especially the british spy fiction i, I think partly because you guys have the national Securities Act, where where the you can't talk about anything, but you can put it in fiction, right? So I think right. like Graham Greene and people like this, right? They would put into the stories things like false flags and this kind of stuff, and and you 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 would notice that in the fiction they're putting more truth than what would come out in the media. So I was kind of tying that into what was going on with Bond. So I think on one level there's just the kind of um, it's not that everybody's in on it, but there are people who study the way to uh, manipulate people's minds through fiction um, that, for example, when, when Hitchcock premiered psycho, 
that was actually studied. People studied the reaction of the audience to the, the first slasher movie. And, and it had a profound effect on people, right? And nowadays they've got it to the point where, I mean, the, the military, I mean, they, they hand out movies in, in the US military, for example, uh, if you watch that movie, um, um, uh, Men Who Stare at Goats, at the end of the movie, they're actually figuring out what DVDs to hand out, I think in Iraq, because they're, they're gonna flood the country with American pop culture mm -hmm. to, to do psychological warfare. Um, in fact, there's an entire satire movie based on this principle. It's a ridiculous film, but it's worth watching just for this point. It's called Josie and the Pussycats. It came out in about 2002 or three. Mm. I think it has Rosario Dawson in it. And uh, the whole purpose of that movie is pop culture as social engineering. So it's not a, it's not like there's one guy who, you know, this. every time I talk about this, people mischaracterize and straw man the position. Oh, you think there's one guy who tells everybody what to do in the entertainment? No, no, I'm not saying that. It's more so uh, it's if, if there's a movement, for example, that pops up, it can organically pop up. But what happens is that people who study culture, people who do social engineering, they can, they'll, they'll watch and study and see how to steer it. So that's how it works, right? This, I believe this happened with the, um, the 60s stuff, the counterculture. Um, it, why would Time Magazine, Atlantic Record, the, what the top corporations, right, at that time in media and in, 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 uh, record, record production, they begin to promote the most avant-garde bizarre stuff, right? Um, now you could say, well, it's just to make money. It's not just to make money, right? They weren't hurting for money. It's to so it's to to be to to have change agents to change and move the culture, and if it was just about money, they wouldn't do these things at a loss. Many of these comp companies will operate and do these things at a loss. It's not just about money. Uh, it's not a money problem. It's a it's a higher level plan of social engineering. And so, there's countless white papers to document this. The Velvet Underground, for example, I suppose would have been a change agent, wouldn't they? Maybe there's some weird things about uh, uh, Nico and, and who she was connected to. And it's so I, I hesitate to say for sure that now I can say with um, so uh, Jackson Pollock, uh, he received uh, CIA money to produce the art that he did. Um, Warhol uh, got CIA money. And so this was part of a thing called the Congress for Cultural Freedom. Now, I'm not saying that the CIA runs everything, but the, the argument was, as has come out in many pieces and even uh, UK media, I think the Independent or the Telegraph has put out articles about abstract modernist art being funded by the CIA and the auspices were the Cold War. Oh, well, we got to have this, this uh, psychological warfare argument that we got to have freedom in art, total unrestricted freedom in art to combat Soviet realism and cosmism. Yeah. Because, yeah. So there's one easy example. Uh, there's an academic, Francis Stoner Saunders, wrote her whole book, uh, uh, CIA and the uh, Cold War. Her whole book, I'm going from memory, but her whole book is on this the usage of the arts during the Cold War. Uh, this is what I wrote my master's thesis on. So I, I know this topic very well. And that's just one example of uh, the tie in between social engineering, pop culture. You could call it the deep state. And it's not just government. There's also uh, corporations tie in this is what corporations uh, uh, pay for, you know, messages to be put into films. In fact, there was a declassified uh, FOIA request um, that I put in my second book that was some, I think 5,000, there was a FOIA request put into the US government, 5,000 TV shows and movies. I'm going from memory, maybe it's not five, but it's in the thousands. Uh, that the Pentagon had specifically paid to have messages in, right? So everything from Cupcake Wars, the TV show, to Jay Leno TV show, to all the blockbusters. It, it, it's it's a, it really is that expansive. What what, what kind of messages? Um, it could be all kinds of things. It could be uh, messages relating to uh, moral changes. It could be uh, recruitment propaganda. For example, in the eighties. Reagan did this whole move where he he put allocated money towards Hollywood to put out all of these kind of pro military recruitment movies. Uh, Top Gun is one of the most famous yeah. ones in that in that regard. Some of them are really bad stink bombs. Uh, there's one I think uh, <laughs> Charlie Sheen's uh, movie Navy Seals. It's 
pretty bad. But what you realize, and again, there's a, a good book on this called Operation Hollywood, where they, they documented the connection between the, just in that case, just the Pentagon and movies. That's not all there is. There's also the long time consult uh, consultation between the CIA and Hollywood. Um, there's a movie that came out around right after 9-11 uh with ryan is it ryan felipe and no it's colin firth and uh al pacino called the recruit and that's the first movie that we know was basically a joint project of whatever studio and the cia the cia right. literally helped make that movie and and it's surprising because you would you, you would think it would be a totally a, a pro uh cia propaganda movie and in a roundabout way it is but in the movie al pacino plays the corrupt handler so it actually has a, a negative view of Al Pacino as the CIA handler who's corrupt. Um, but the, but the, the, the message that you come away with is that, oh, well, it's just a few bad apples here and there, right? <laughs> so the, the, yeah. the system is good. It's going to weed out the bad apples. Don't worry. Uh, but we do admit there's some bad apples here and there, right? right. So not, not everything that's, we, we mustn't think of propaganda. I know you don't, but we, we mustn't think of propaganda as being that simplistic to where it's just going to be some, you know, uh, uh, like Lone Survivor was a big one of these propaganda films. I think that's the one with uh, Mark Wahlberg or where he goes and he like can snipe, you know, 50 uh, Afghanis or something. Like that. That, that's all pretty blatant propaganda, right? That, that yeah. our, our boys can easily snipe, you know, 50 of their guys. Um, but there's more, but, but other movies, uh, the Bin Laden, uh, uh, Zero, Dark Thirty, that was completely a CIA consulted movie. So we start to realize that this goes a lot deeper. And I want to be sensitive to that. Uh, I, I'm not a pacifist. I'm not an anti-war person who never, I, I'm not a, a left liberal. Uh, I'm speaking of this just as a person who's objectively looking at the way um, the, the, the stage has worked with the government well it's sure it's that goes back all the, that goes back centuries in your country yeah it's entirely possible to to enjoy a propaganda movie while knowing it's propaganda but enjoying sure. enjoying the the war movie um you know i mean red dawn well virgil virgil's aeneid is propaganda <laughs> it was propaganda written for the roman empire yeah well well it, it, exactly i uh, yeah which reminds me i must get victor davis hansen on the show sometime uh he'd be a good one i think um what about the matrix i mean the matrix just seems so good at explaining the shit that's going on i mean it's it is the best analogy isn't it the red pill blue blue pill thing it's How a good analogy i think it's limited yeah i think it's limited because the ultimate uh presupposition of that film is gnostic so the idea being that we we live in a in a if if you take it in a metaphysical sense it was yeah. it's gnostic right that we live in a in, in Plato's cave in a literal sense and like we got to get out of this world and and I don't think that's true I think that would be just to re reaffirm ancient gnosticism but if you if you use it as kind of a a governmental or moral analogy yeah absolutely yeah okay so yeah I, I suppose on that basic level um, it's like you either know that that everything we've ex we're experiencing is a kind of a construct of propaganda or you don't yes and most people don't want to just don't want to accept that can we we should we should do another we should do another podcast sometime if you if you're if you're Anytime. if you're willing but there's a question that that's been puzzling me and and it's it's one of the great barriers when I'm trying to explain what's going on or even, you know, if I even dare talk about what's going on to, to kind of people who are still living in, in blue pill world. And that is, we know from reading books, like um, from reading Hayek, that big government is a very poor allocator of, of of scarce resources it's really 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 shit at, at just kind of organizing stuff and yet that is the principle of of technocracy that that experts know better than we do what's good for us and what we want um and so a lot of people say to me when i when i talk about the stuff that we're talking about they say yeah but what's their motivation why would why would these rich people want to live in a world where there aren't free markets where people aren't you know 
happy and enjoying themselves and and why would they want to, everything to be operated by this kind of central committee global central committee well it makes no sense how, how do you is it is it simply that the elite mentality is sort of psychopathic and malthusian is it is it that basic well that and and um i think again that a human being can opt into evil so you can kind of you can kind of contract yourself in a way to spiritual evil so, you know, the, the way scripture speaks about this is that, you know, you're, you're either kind of seeking God or you're following the, the, the other side, right? Mm. Uh, and if you go the other route, um, you, 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 you will be more and more progressively united with that force or that principle. And so I think that people who have adopted that worldview, that paradigm, uh, are locked into it. And it really is kind of a conversion experience. It really is. A, a, I mean, we, we would say that, that repenting, converting, you know, turning to Christ is a miraculous thing. It's not purely human effort. It's not just an intellectual thing. It, it requires grace. And, and that's a big part of it, right? I mean, uh, if it was just merely intellectual, then all you'd have to do is present to people the information and they would see what's true, right? Yeah. But people don't do that because people it's almost like you have to be given like the glasses to see, right? Like in They Live. I love that film. And if you, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, and the, this is particularly puzzling for me. You know, I mentioned I was at university, but a lot of, a lot of the people now in the, the, the UK government, in the cabinet and so on, these are, these are, my, these are my friends or were my friends. These were... I thought we had the same values. They must know what's going on. They must, they must get given this information at some point. Why do they go along with it? I mean, given that they probably went into politics to do good rather than evil, why do they get sucked into it? Personally, I don't think most people do know. And, and one reason for that is because of the compartmentalization. I think this whole system thrives on compartmentalization of information. So for example, if you look at the way education works, the whole Western education model is derivative of the Prussian model. And the Prussian model 100, 200 years ago was basically a, a strict regimented compartmentalization like a military structure. And so it's a need to know basis. And by the way, you're actually discouraged from making cross disciplinary connections, right? Because, well, you're not an expert in that field uh, maybe you know a little bit in this field. So how dare you try to speak of a, of a connection between biology and logic? Uh, you should never make, you can't do that. That's literally been encouraged or discouraged, I should say, for centuries. Uh, there's books that have been written on the compartmentalization um, of, of education. Uh, Louis Dupre from uh, uh, Yale has a whole book about this, about how the West went in this direction for education. Of all people, Gary North, he has a whole lecture series on how uh, uh, modern education went this route. Charlotte Iserbit uh, that talks about this. So th this is by this is intentional as well, uh, because it, it's a uh, it, it's just evil. I don't know how else to describe the system, except that it's evil. So I think that a lot of people go into public service, civil service, uh, military. Um, I have family members that were in the military. I have I, I know people who work in, you know, intelligence and all, all these kinds of things. The knowledge, the information that they have is is compartmentalized, right? So, for example, if somebody's a Russia analyst, they'll know everything about Russia. And I'm not talking about any specific friend. I, I have a friend who's a good friend of mine. He's a Russia analyst who knows the whole story. He's he's very very well uh, versed and adept at all this. But typically speaking, a person who might go to an Ivy League school and, and focus on it, like that's all they know. I mean, I've talked to professors who have a PhD. I've debated people with PhD in biology. Uh, uh, neurology, and they don't know what a fallacy is. They they don't know what a logical fallacy is, and so that's how compartmentalized education is. You can get a Ph. You can be a brain surgeon. <laughs> you can be. You can know everything about the brain, and you don't know that you can't do a non sequitur <laughs> in a debate, right? So that's how the system works. Is that it has people. I mean, my my dad was involved in Gulf operations, right? So he was not as a high level person. He was just a uh, E3, which in the U.S. Navy is like a, 
it's the highest that you could be as enlisted. So he wasn't an officer, right? Mm -hmm. And he was the guy who pushed the, he worked on this highly advanced gun, the Sea Whiz, which would shoot, I don't know, 100 bullets a second or something crazy like that. And so he was stationed over in the Persian Gulf uh, during the 80s Gulf crisis and Reagan had them uh, sink a wall platform, right? So my dad was the guy who pushed the button to sink the wall platform on this gun, right? So he knew everything about this gun, but he didn't know the coordination that was going on for that operation in the Gulf. Yeah. So I think I'm just using it as an, I think that's how the system works with the, all of this kind of stuff. And we're at this weird venue now where, you know, 30 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, the only people that would read tragedy and hope would be people who got a PhD in international relations, right? Mm -hmm. People who were getting that higher level uh, research and study, or if you studied under uh, professor Quigley or something like that, no, nobody else is going to be reading that book. But we're in this weird situation now where because of the, the free access of information, I mean, well, I guess until the algorithm yeah. changed to where yeah. you're hiding everything, but <laughs> prior to that, right? I mean, anybody now can access and make these cross-disciplinary connections, which 30 years ago, only a high, high level person could do that. Yes. I was wondering whether, um, I mean, what we've seen during this, during the, the, the pandemic, it's like they've become much more overt about yeah. plans which were hitherto very well concealed. And that this is the only, my only happy take home from, from these, from the last 12 months is that they're so blatant, so increasingly blatant that more people are being awakened to what's going on. Yeah, I think so. I think, uh, I, I hope, uh, I pray at least that that this was a big misstep uh, in, in regard to being too heavy handed. Um, a lot of people have seen through this. Hopefully it's enough. I don't, I don't the, the problem of course is, is as Brzezinski said that in the future, the public won't remember the news cycle from two weeks ago. So, <laughs> I mean, so that's what I, my concern is that people are not going to even care to remember and they're going to be too dominated by fear. Um, I mean, I, I, ha I had a person the other day, I was showing them the SPARS document and we, we, were, we were almost in a fist fight. I mean, that's how crazy people are getting over this stuff. You show them, you've got the document on your phone, you're scrolling, you know, and the, these people are in your face over masks. And if you're not going to get the jab, uh, you, you're killing, you're a murderer, you're a serial killer, and you need to have your face punched in. So, I mean, I was this close to, to a fist fight with somebody over this the other day. Not, and I didn't provoke it. It's just that people are, are losing their mind. So hopefully, I don't know. I, I, I don't know what to say about that. Well, yeah, it would be nice to end the show on a bit of um, optimism though, wouldn't it? Because because I think a lot of people are in a, in a dark place. A lot of people who see are thinking, well, this is a kind of, you know, you've already had a, a, a coup conducted in America. You know, your presidency has been stolen. Um, but this is happening on a global scale. And, and people are looking around and feeling like Jews in, in, in the early 1930s and thinking, is this the time to, to flee somewhere else? But where would you go to? I mean, this is the problem. It's, it, this, it's global for once. There's no... Exactly. This is the first time that we've really seen it roll out as global. Uh, and to me, that suggests that, I mean, if you don't believe in, a, in, the, in the at least nascent form of a global government to come, then how did this all roll out globally? Uh, obviously, it's, it's here. We're in the, the dystopia is now. Uh, and my, my hope, my optimism would be, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day who was formerly a kind of libertarian atheist who, who uh, got into the, this via the diet realm he went down the diet rabbit hole and now he's he's ended up uh converted as, a, as an orthodox christian and he said you know from for me what it was was a it was the red pill and that got me out of the blue pill land and he says then i went through a phase of black pill where i was just ah forget it it's all worthless we're all screwed and he says then the black pill led me to the god pill <laughs> the white pill so that would be my optimism is that the way I retain my sanity is that it, it, if the Christian paradigm and narrative is true, it sure does have a lot of explanatory power. Like it makes sense why we're seeing what we're saying. If Christianity is not true, if that paradigm isn't correct, there's not really, 
I, I, I don't, I mean, I guess I would be a nihilist. I don't know. But, uh, but that paradigm to me uh, makes perfect sense. It has, it has tremendous explanatory value. I think you're, I think you're right, Jay. I, I don't think the black pill is, is a good place to be. I think the the God pill is 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 much better, and I and I think also that we need we need that spiritual dimension because we can't you know I don't think human clay is going to do this on its own. I think we need more than that. We need we need super supernatural forces to help us win this win this fight. Well, I was reading the secular psychologists uh, some of their articles about the serial killers, and and even they were starting to notice with pretty recent articles that they started realizing. All these serial killers that they seem to talk about having these personalities that take them over and maybe there's demons right so it's almost like yeah exactly it kind of sounds like what jesus says right so even secular i think psychologists who don't even have any interest in this stuff or just just from looking at these crazy serial killers are like man some something demonic's going on here yeah yeah i think so um jay thank you so much um uh, and uh, hey everyone if you've enjoyed this 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 podcast don't forget to support me on on Patreon or Subscribestar. I'm absolutely useless at plugging my my um my. I, I, are you better than me at that, Jay? I'm I'm just crap at it. I'm just like. I guess because I'm I'm am an American. I'm used to selling, right? So I'm used to doing the sales pitch. Can you, you know? give me some? Can you give me some tips? I mean, I I should have done a pitch at the beginning, <laughs> shouldn't I? And stuff. And I, I, what? I, I just repeat just a, a basic look. Remember everybody to like subscribe and share and uh, be sure and support me on the website go to jay's analysis blah, blah, blah. i just i just repeat the same thing yeah yeah well don't forget to support jay as well everyone um but yeah support me because <laughs> i because because i'm more desperate because i'm crapper at, at the uh at the promotion um yeah jay well, can i get you to come on sometime and uh let me let me in, uh in, interlocute you and and oh uh, god it would be an, get some of your pick your brain it would be an absolute pleasure um, it really would. And, and cross pollination is always a good thing. And we are so few. I mean, I, I, I don't want people to be down, down hearted, yeah. but, but we are a kind of band of brothers. I mean, that's, that's the other good thing that's come out of this. I've, I have met the best people the, the, I, I seen, it, it's like we become magnets, don't we? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, talking about this stuff has, like you said, one of the greatest uh, benefits has been meeting some of the best people, hands down. And just becoming better informed. That's quite exciting. The life of the mind. I mean, that's the, that's the other thing I've, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking. I want to do a parallel. You, you, you've already done this. Um, you know, I was, I was talking to my wife about this today that I don't just want to be the guy with the tin foil hat who, who rabbits on about, you know, esoteric stuff. I want to actually talk about art, literature, stuff that, stuff that from, that, from our old world, which we need to preserve and, and, and protect and cherish, because these are, these are some of the finest flowerings of, 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 of mankind. And so I suppose an expression of God, you know? Absolutely, yeah. What did Nietzsche say? Uh, arts will save the West, something like that. Well, the Nietzsche was probably yeah. I mean, they are. You look. You look at a. You look at the fan vaulting in Ely. I mentioned this before in the Ely Cathedral or or whatever. You look at the stuff that 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 that's we transcend ourselves. We we uh, by creating this right. stuff. And I don't want to lose that. I, uh, I was listening to an extract from Desert Island Disc. You probably know it's a show we get in the in the UK. Uh, listening to. Um, Beethoven's seventh and I'm thinking well I don't want to be in a world where the technocrats can can erase everything of value about mankind the, the, a mankind that could create the seven, Beethoven's seventh symphony that's so, yeah, that, and if you if you read Brave New World Mustafa Mann the world socialist controller says that he his job is precisely to do that to erase those things and we are seeing that happening everywhere, all around us. That's the, the, in the academy, it is about destroying, yep. it is, it's kind of anti-knowledge. Anti Absolutely, well, Bertrand Russell said, you won't read Shakespeare. When the technocracy comes, you're not gonna be reading Shakespeare. Ain't that the truth? Well, we, we've, got a, we've got a fight for the world where we still get to read Shakespeare. We have to. Jay, thanks, I'll, I'll, def I'll definitely do your show. Um, it'd be very exciting. And thank you.
All right. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be on. Have a nice day. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. You too. Keep it the good work. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye.